really am going to need your help this week. Uh, it was a week that was fuller than any of us planned. You know what I mean with the blizzard and all. And yesterday I was blessed, truly blessed, with the board retreat, which was a wonderful time for us to be together most of the day. But before that, I was blessed in the way that is uncertain to deliver the invocation at the state of the city uh, breakfast. So I prepared for that, and then I went to the retreat. And then the greatest blessing came at the end of the day when I met with a family to celebrate a life that has just ended. What that meant was my sermon didn't get as much thoughtful attention as I would have liked, because you see, well, Wednesday, we had a snow day, right? But I don't know about you, but a snow day in my house means I go outside and I shovel all day long. I don't snow blow, I shovel. I use the back part of me, and I was there for several hours. And the reason I'm telling you this is that as I'm finishing up helping a neighbor, uh, a car backs out of a driveway across the street, and it's backing up in order to go up the street. You know what you do when you do that, right? And <clears throat> the young person driving the car backed up and backed into another car and damaged it. And something happened that I didn't expect. As, in this case, she is driving up the street, I find myself, literally find myself, standing in the street saying, Hey! Come back here! Because she hurt the car. It's wrong, right? But what good can I do? Just standing in the street with a shovel is not a very intimidating moment. So I resume shoveling and fuming now. Fuming. And then down the street comes the car. I don't know if she looked in the rearview mirror. I don't know if she realized she'd been seen. I don't know. But there she was saying, oops. And I said, yeah, you should leave a message on the windshield, which she did. I want to start with that because I need your help, because I need your help to get this sermon out of me knowing that I'm challenged by having a very long day yesterday, by having to shovel lots of snow, sometimes more than once, by realizing there are people here, hi, they're up there, I don't know you, but I want to give you something to take away, and you're not going to say, boy, I wish we'd gone to some other church this morning. <laughs> I'm doing that because when I gestured to Richard over there, he's not only a man from Lansing, he's a former Baptist minister, so I need to reach for something there to really get his attention going. And there's a Presbyterian minister, retired now, who's here, and I know he's looking in his book of faith and order to see how far off the track I am. <laughs> and then finally, I have a great colleague from uh, Plymouth Church who's visiting with me today, Doug Van Doren. So they're all taking notes saying, well, is he as good as they say? And I don't know, I need your help, gentlemen, ladies, friends, comrades. I need you all to help me get this sermon out about prophecy which is why I always pause as I start to utter a little prayer. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be found true in thy sight, thou who art my rock and my redeemer, to call upon all those things so that you may hear a good word through all the awkward ones I have. So there I am in the middle of the street, shaking my shovel, and here she comes again. I mention this because I think all of us have had moments in our lives when, without planning, we found ourselves rising up indignantly about something that happened to us or someone else. Have you had that experience? Without even trying, you're suddenly shaking your fist or shouting or seething or you find yourself leaping up to do something. I mention this experience because we've all had it, and it's the key to the idea of a prophet but the only part of what's key. A scholar in whom I place great faith, James Luther Adams, a, a liberal Christian, said something about the temperature test of the human spirit. He said, whenever you find yourself rising up with indignation at something unjust, 
you can be sure a sacred principle somewhere is at stake. The question is, do we know what that principle is? And that's the challenge of the prophet. Not just to rise up with indignation, but to be indignant about something worthy of our indignity. It's going to take all month to figure that out. This week I'm going to talk about one example of prophets and the two things we can learn from this prophet. The one I'm talking about today is Elijah Eliyahu Hanavi, the, the one who is God's, who rises up out of nowhere in the middle of the stories of ancient Israel in the book of Kings. You can read the book of Kings, or I can tell you this brief story is that he's a Tishbite. Nobody knows what a Tishbite is. It's a town somewhere in the middle of ancient Israel. And he shows up to tell Ahab that unless he gets back on course with his religion, there will be a drought that lasts for years. Ahab is the king. Elijah is a guy from the village. Do you think Ahab pays much attention to Elijah? Thus saith the Lord, who cares? You're just a Tishbite. I'm the king. So he ignores it. And of course, what does Elijah do at this point? He realizes he's not being listened to, so he flees into the wilderness to try to get his head on straight. And when he comes back out, he challenges Ahab to prove which of the gods out there is the true God, the God of Elijah, the one we know is going to win, by the way, or the God of Ahab and Jezebel, otherwise known as Baal, You've all have heard Baal, B-A-A-L. And there's a contest. They literally hold a contest. It's like a reality show for God. <laughs> Two Walters, both of them with dead meat on top of them. And Elijah says, whichever one is consumed by fire, that's the God worth worshiping. And so Ahab and Jezebel set up a great altar, and 400 priests dance around it half the day, and they scream, and they shout, and they sing, and even cut themselves to show how devoted they are. No fire. Elijah, one guy, stands next to his altar, filled with dead meat. And, well, I'm sure he said something noble, but it essentially came down like, yo, and boom, the fire comes down out of the sky, consumes all the meat and the altar too. You'd think Ahab would be impressed. He's not. He goes back to his palace and Elijah realizes that even if he can call fire out of heaven, he is still in Dutch with Ahab and Jezebel. And so he runs off into the wilderness again and hides for fear that he will be found. And it is there in that spot that one of the great moments in ancient lore takes place because he's in a cave and he sees a fiery whirlwind and then he hears a great storm of wind thinking that God is there. He peeks his head out of the cave, but God is not in the whirlwind and not in the fire. He's not even in the earthquake that's happening. And then in the silence, in the silence, there's a still, small, God. If you've heard the phrase, the still, small voice, that's where it comes from. And the voice of God is saying, get out of here. Go back. Return. Do the job I sent you to do. Now, I'm telling you this story not because it happened. I'm sure it did not. But it tells us about a key element of the prophet. The first part I've already told you, that moment when you rise up with indignation at something that needs to be said, that's wrong. Stop that. We've all done it. What we forget is that everyone who ever did that, from Elijah down to Martin Luther King Jr. and others, is that when they said it, they were terrified. Elijah hides. Jonah jumps on a boat. Every prophet who knew what a prophet was going to get into runs as fast as she or he can to avoid it. Because what happens to prophets? Did you remember what we read this morning? Grandchildren of those who stoned the prophets gather up. This is not a job you volunteer for. 
Nobody says, hey, I want to be a prophet. Throw rocks at me now. No one does that. You should be afraid. A true prophet is always terrified. Terrified that if you name the, right, the unrighteousness, if you name the indignity, if you name the injustice, that you will find people who want to shut you up. And we only need to talk about the two men that we celebrated in January, Martin Luther King Jr. and Mohandas Karamchand Gandhi, to know that they ended their lives because they dared to speak of their indignation and people took their lives. No one in their right mind volunteers to be a prophet. You're supposed to be afraid. You'd better be afraid. And I'm giving you this advice because there are plenty of prophets out there who seem to live in very large houses, have very great crowds who follow them around, and seem to get into a lot of famous environments. Any prophet that's doing well financially is lying. Right? Any prophet who tells you something you want to hear is lying. Any prophet who is not being chased is not a prophet. Because the prophet always delivers unwelcome truth. Which is why so few of them are preachers. <laughs>